Good morning, everyone. I'm not sure who's going to be able to catch this live, but I wanted to still come on and do the live video. Um, I didn't... Good morning. I'm not sure who just... Um, who's watching it now, but good morning. Um, I'm doing the live today. Good morning, Stacy. <laughs> I'm doing the live today instead of yesterday because a lot of things have, has um, been going on, and I'm going to do an update. I actually recorded the update, but I couldn't upload it, so I'm just going to redo the update. But a lot of things are um, changing for me and everything like that within ministry, within my church. And then I found out another one of my relatives passed away. So it's been interesting um, balancing everything and getting back on track. And then I also just got back from Tennessee. So I've been extremely tired. So I didn't do anything yesterday. Like yesterday was just all about me just relaxing but um yeah i just wanted to come on today which is wednesday and knock out jonah 4 this is the last chapter there are only what 11 verses yeah 11 verses and um i wanted to knock this out so we can be done with jonah um the next bible study thank you stacy um the next bible study i'm aiming for may but it might be in june so April, we're not going to have a Bible study because I want to get everything in order with um, James as well as catching up on some things that I need to catch up on. Um, I will be elevated in August to um, a full-blown minister at my church, which is exciting and nerve-wracking. So I'm going to have five months to basically get myself in order before the elevation, um, which, which requires me to attend Bible studies at my church as well as the ministerial development classes at my church. Good morning, Latoya. Hi, Tanya. But, um, so yeah, it, it's a lot of, go you know, stuff going on. And, um, I didn't think that I would break down when I found out my, that my cousin had died. Um, but I did on Tuesday. I broke down like a hot mess. And, um, it's kind of hard because it's like I've been losing people back to back to back to back since last year. Um, I lost, uh, a deacon that was basically like a father. He was a really... I don't want to call him a father figure, but he was kind of like a fa father figure to me at the end of um, 2018. Then I lost my grandmother. Then I lost my first spiritual dad, which was my first bishop. And now I lost a cousin. My aunt and um, my aunt and my uncle were just in a hospital, one with a heart problem and the other one with a brain aneurysm. So it's it's a lot going on. Um, and I didn't think that I would break down, but I did break down. So I'm trying to get everything together. And then I know with... Um, this new elevation that's getting ready to take place with me as far as becoming a minister there's going to be a, a lot of different challenges and struggles that i'm going to have to overcome so i'm going to just have to take april and probably may to just get everything together um so yeah but um thank you tanya thank you latoya yeah thank you stacy yeah it's it's exciting um very very exciting i i just had the trip to tennessee with my bishop and my pastor and that was interesting because I was basically, like, the only person from my ministry that was there. Like, my mom went, but she's an evangelist. And then the youth pastor went, but he's a youth pastor. So I was, like, the only one that was, like, there that wasn't really, that didn't really have a title per se. Um, and then my bishop announced me at one of the services as a minister in training. And then on Sunday, me and him had a private conversation and he told me that I was a minister elect. So yeah, it's it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot going on. And um I'm excited, nervous at the same time. So I'm gonna talk about all that in an update video. I don't want this video, <laughs> this live to be too long. So I am gonna have an update uh video for you guys, if not today, tomorrow, about everything that's going on. But um yeah, Jonah. So last one, chapter four, only eleven verses. Hopefully we're not here too long, but we probably will be. I will, Latoya. Yeah, I'm, de I'm definitely going to need it. Um, I'll talk about everything in that update because there's a lot <laughs> going on um, and a lot of requirements over the next five months in order for me to um, complete the elevation. So lots of stuff. But the Bible I'm using is the New King James uh, Journaling Bible from Thomas Nelson. It's what, what is this called? Oh, gosh, I don't forgot the name of the Bible. This is called, yeah, Journal the Word <laughs> Bible. It's the New King James. It's from Thomas Nelson. This is the old edition. Um, I think this is in the turquoise, turquoise floral, uh, cloth bound cover. I don't even know what it's called. I forgot. But yeah, it's the older edition because I know they have the new edition with the references. Um, but this is the older one. I have the Jonah notes here for the study. 
I have another piece of paper that I'm going to use just in case. I might not need it because I have a lot of space, but I have that. My post-it notes, um, writing utensils. So I use the Micron, Micron 01 Archival Ink Pigma pen. It's a .25 millimeter. I use that to write my notes in the Bible. And then I use this. Uh, this is just a regular pen that I got from my local discount store. It's a .7 millimeter, obviously, because I like those to write my notes in. Highlighting my outliners from Zebra. The Crayola Twistable Colored Pencils, because I love these. I also have the Super Tips from Crayola. These are really great for highlighting in your Bibles. The Sharpie Smear God Highlighters. These are the ones that I pick up from my local um, Rite Aid. They're, on, they're less than like $3. Sometimes they're $2, sometimes 3 It really depends, but um, they don't have the little clips on them. So those are the ones that I use. And then what I used to use, and I actually miss using, are the gel highlighters. These are the, oh my god, what, what are these called? I think they're called Casemate. It's the Wal uh, the Walmart brand. Um, I think it's Case made or pen and gear or it's one of those but it's just a gel um highlighter i actually do enjoy using these i just haven't used them in such a long time because i found other things to use i'm actually gonna probably utilize these today we'll see but um yeah i had breakfast so hopefully my stomach doesn't start growling <laughs> i had two sandwiches this morning and i'm drinking coffee right now so yeah i'm gonna quickly pray us in and then we're just going to dive right into this. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for giving us the activities of our limbs and our organs, Father God. We thank you just for your mercy and your grace, for the compassion that you show us. I'm asking that you come into the study, Holy Spirit, and allow us to take something out of this study that we can utilize for ourselves and truly understand your word and apply. Amen. Yeah. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so the way that I do this for those who are new to watching this in the group or on YouTube, I basically read um, paragraph by paragraph, section by section. But for this, because it's only 11 verses, I'm probably going to just read it straight through the first time. So the first step is to just read through. Um, the second step is then to circle words that I want to define. And those are going to be words that I do know and I don't know. That's because a lot of the times... Um, when the Bible was written, especially the Old Testament, it was originally written in Hebrew, and we change definitions. Unfortunately, that's how um, you know the English do. We've changed a lot of the definitions and meanings. So you really want to be able to understand the context of the scripture from the time that it was written, and not in the um, English kind of understanding of it. And I actually did that recent did that recently with the um, forty day prayer challenge that we're doing. This week we're going through the Lord's Prayer which is Matthew 6 verses 9 to, through 13 and um, one of the words that I had to define was temptation because a lot of the times we look at temptation as a bad thing but temptation written back in the Greek te the Greek testament written in the Greek language doesn't really mean um, you know something that's evil it's more like a test or a trial so it's, it's better to understand the original language of a word than it is to just look up the English Merriam-Webster's or Oxford Dictionary um, so that's what I do. So I read through without any markings. The second time I go through and I circle words that I want to define. The third time I then underline parts of verses, parts of phrases, anything that really just sticks out to me. I follow that up by then doing my notes. Then I box everything, do arrows and add color because color just pleases my eyesight. It makes me happy and it makes it fun. <laughs> so we are going to start this off. Good morning, <laughs> Brooklyn. Hey, see, I'm from the Bronx. I used to hang out in Brooklyn all the time. I actually went to school in Queens, so I love my New Yorkers. <laughs> but um, okay, so I titled this chapter um, "Heart Check" because this was really where um, Jonah started to kind of just become bitter and it's not I don't want to say bitter but I'm gonna say bitter um he just got really angry for no reason and his anger is very different from the anger that Job had if you um if you guys know the story of Job um Job was angry but his anger wasn't in the wrong place it, it, it's, it's hard to explain what I'm trying to say oh my gosh his heart was in the right place even though he was angry whereas Jonah's heart was in the wrong place and he was angry so um 
I just called it heart check. So I'm just going to simply read verses 1 through 11 through and then we're going to dive in. So um, it says Jonah's anger and God's kindness. Chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live verse 4 then the lord said is it right for you to be angry so jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city there he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might till he might see what will become of the city and the lord prepared a plant and made it come up over jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery so jonah was very grateful to the plant Verse 7, but as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Verse 9, then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry even to death. But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up at night. I'm sorry, which came up in a night and perished in a night. Verse 11. And should I not pity Nineveh, the great, that great city in which are more than 170, I'm sorry, more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and much livestock? Okay. So. I read that terribly, of course, but, you know, normal stuff that we have to deal with. <laughs> and now I'm going to circle words that I want to define. So going back to verse 1, I have the word displeased and angry. Going to verse 8, I have the word... I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce this word because every time I get it right, I forget the, the, the way you pronounce it. So that word right there. Let me zoom in just a bit. Can I zoom in? Oh, yes, I can. Lovely. So that word right there. I, I can never pronounce that correctly. So I just give up on that. Um, the next one is going to be in verse 10 and it's going to be pity. And the last word is going to be discern. And that's in verse 11 right here. So I've already written those down, of course, but um, displeased, this is the Hebrew word for the word, and then the meaning is to be evil or bad, make someone annoyed or dissatisfied. Angry, the Hebrew word, and it's to burn or be kindled with anger. That word there, vehement. I don't even know. I'm not even going to pronounce it. <laughs> it's a sense of silence, quiet, or it can mean sultry. Um, and then the definition for sultry I did look up, which is um, hot or humid air. Pity is to look upon with compassion or concern. And then discern is to know, discriminate, or distinguish. So I wrote all that down here, and I'm just now going to use... My colors to do this. So let's see. But yeah, I hope all of you are well. Again, I know I haven't been active as I used to be. I really miss being as active as I used to in the group, um, especially because we have new people joining the group. So I'm definitely gonna work on, but you know, getting back into being super active. Alrighty, I want to use this brown. And one more color. So we have the definitions down. I'm just going to stick that over here for now. 
Okay, so going back to verse 1. So it says, it displeased Jonah exceedingly. So basically, um, something about seeing the Gentiles being saved displeased or rather annoyed Jonah rather than make him jump for joy over God's mighty and sovereign hand. Um, so back in um, chapter 3, we see that the people of Nineveh basically started to believe and um, they turned away from their sinful ways. They went on a fast and they put God first. So this, instead of making it um, a joyous occasion where the prophet should be excited, he's now upset because God is forgiving um, a bunch of pagan Gentiles. So I feel like this is something where um, personally we need to have a heart check because I know there are some some instances where I will pray to God and God will be like, do this. And I'm just like, I don't want to do that because if I do that, then you're going to forgive this person because this person is going to change their ways and then I'm not going to have justice. And I feel like that's how Jonah was. He wanted justice for something that really had nothing to do with him, um, but he took his position, I guess, as a prophet and one of God's chosen people and kind of started to judge people. So, um, you know, then it says he became angry. So he was upset with the success of his preaching, obsessed, upset with the outcome of God's judgment. So God told him to go give a word to Nineveh and the word came, you know, the word was, was given forth um, and the people of Nineveh changed. So not only was he annoyed that they changed um now he's angry with himself because what he preached the word that god told him to preach came true it was successful so um god granted repentance to the enemies of judah and israel um he believed they needed judgment and he by um, by he i mean jonah so jonah honestly believed that the um pagan gentiles and Nineveh, the ninevites needed to be judged um but instead of being judged God granted them repentance, and then he extended mercy to them. That kind of pissed them off. And I'm sure there's been, you know, many times when some of us have wanted justice for something or we felt that someone needed a specific judgment. I know for me, when I, wa I don't watch the news. Um, that's one thing I don't do. I personally hate the news. Um, my mother gets upset because I don't watch the news, but I just don't like watching the news because the news, they really report a lot of terrible things. And every now and then, like, of like, let's see. Out of 10 terrible news, they'll probably report one or two good things. And it's just like, is this all that? I, I don't want to know about a terrorist. I don't want to know about a rapist. I don't want to know about a murderer. But it's just like a lot of the people that I see on the news that are out there raping kids, um, abducting kids, sex trafficking, like that pisses me off. And I feel like those people need judgment. But it's not for me <laughs> to say they need judgment. It's for God to give that judgment. But then again, he extends mercy to a lot of the people. A lot of the times these people out here murdering other people, they don't get killed. Um, that That's terrible to say it that way. <laughs> but um, they don't get the death sentence. They probably will have life in jail. Some of them might get, you know, early release for good behavior. Like that's mercy for them from God. Whereas I feel if you murdered somebody, especially if you're a grown man murdering a six year old kid, or if you're a grown man out here raping a four year old girl, I feel like you need you need to be judged. But it's not for me to do that. So um I feel like that's how Jonah is at this point in time. He's just really upset and ungrateful. Um one that God is sovereign to that he extended mercy to some people that should not have been given mercy and he wants to see i don't want to say ret retribution but um he wants to see them suffer basically but this is a prophet that wants to see this happen so as a prophet that's terrible for him to feel that way but then again this also shows us that um jonah's only human like he's only human Yeah, say, see, see, living in New York, I used to live in New York, now I'm in Jersey, like, the news out here is ridiculous, you got people killing each other, you got all these bomb threats, like, I don't like watching the news, I really hate, like, I know hate is a very strong word, but I personally really hate watching the news, because it's always something negative, it's never something good, and if it's something good, they're only showing it for, like, five minutes, but then the rest of the, what, the, the rest of the two, three hours, they're reporting terrible things, and it, frustrates me so i personally just choose not to watch the news i know i should watch news because it's very helpful but um i i just i don't like watching news it it, it really puts me in a very 
sad state <laughs> um almost like a depressed state and i don't like feeling that way so i just choose not to watch the news i find out news through my mother through facebook because people will like will repost things or um just from google period but as far as like me sitting to watch the news i don't do it i, I don't i can't do it anymore <laughs> it's too depressing honestly um but yeah so going on to verse two it says uh, where is it? Uh, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God. So I'm going to underline, I know that you are a, sorry, I'm not sure if you guys can see that. I hate when I get to the bottom of the page because then it's hard to like write. For I know that you are a gracious and merciful God. So. Here we have Jonah, who knows that God is one of mercy. Um, he simply affirms the nature of God, kind of like Moses did. He gives undeserved favor, um, is forgiving and compassionate towards his children. So he knows the type of God that he serves. He knows the type of God that is telling him to do something. And um, he's clearly acknowledging it, but he's using his acknowledgement to justify what happened in chapter one and chapter one is when he obviously fled tried to run away from the presence of god when he went to to rush when tarsha sorry when he got on the boat with the the the, the, the what do they call them the mariners i think that's what they call them I'm trying to remember what they call these people um i'm just gonna say with with the people on the ship because i think they call them mariners but i can't recall right now but um so he's using his acknowledgement of God and who God is as justification for the reason why he tried to run from God's presence. And personally, I think that is the dumbest thing to ever do. Um, you can't acknowledge God while using your acknowledgement of him to justify the sins that you're committing. Because that's basically what he did. Jonah sinned. He, he tried to run away from God. He disobeyed God's orders. Um, so now you're using your acknowledgement saying, yes, I know that you're a gracious and merciful God, but this is why I ran away. Because you're as such. That makes no sense. It, it just it it never makes sense so um you know you know who god is but you're affirming who he is and using your affirmation of him and your acknowledgement of him to justify your sinfulness and unfortunately that's what a lot of us do probably not to the means that um jonah did it but we tend to say okay well i know that he's a merciful god so I'm going to still live the way that I'm living because I know that he'll forgive me or, you know, I know that he's a merciful God. So I'm not going to speak the word that he gave me to speak to somebody. I'm not going to be a light for someone because I know he's merciful. So he's going to forgive me. He's going to have compassion on them. Like you can't use that as an excuse to um, live in sin, be in sin, be angry, be mis. Like you can't really use that. And that's basically what he did. So, um. I'm going to say he tried to use his affirmation of God. And I know my nails look crazy. I need to um go get a filling like really, really soon. So, yeah, <laughs> um, to justify his sins. Oh, what time is it? Because, okay. Not bad, not bad. Good on time. Okay. Um, oh, and the, I do have a cross-reference for that. It's going to be Exodus uh, 34 and 6. And that just has to do with Moses. So, Exodus 34 and 6 is the cross reference. Moving on, it says, slow to anger. So, the fact that he is slow to anger, we can now understand that God is patient with our disobedience. He will be very patient with us. There have been times, example I can use is me. I like using myself as an example for a lot of these things because I have so many examples. <laughs> but um, I knew what my calling was uh, as far as like ministry and God's kingdom for a very long time, for years. Um, 
But I mentioned before how I uh, basically pulled myself away when I was initially called out to be a minister in training. This was, whew, when was my son was born in 2014. So this is probably back in 2013, 2012, probably even before 2012. Um, I was called to be a minister in training. And I, that's when I was like really deep in depression and dealing with um, sexual sin and all that. I didn't want it. Um, and I know that you can't run from God's call. Like, there's just no way to run from it. You, you have to do it regardless if you're going to do it voluntarily or involuntarily. It will get done. Um, for me, I just was like, I'm not doing it. I don't want to do it. I'm never going to do it. I'm, I'm going to pull myself away. So that's what I did. I pulled myself away. I sat in the first row um, because, like, the front row was kind of like where the ministers and evangelists and things sit. So I sat there for, like, two or three Sundays and then after then I stopped going to church um and then when I would go I wouldn't sit where I was supposed to sit I was sitting back in like my original third or fourth row seat um and I would get comfortable there and I I would always hear God telling me you know this is not what you're supposed to do I need you to do this I need you to listen to me and do this and I would just be like no I'm not doing it fast forward now to um 2019 <laughs> it's almost five six five or six years later um I'm now preparing to walk in the full call <laughs> So he has definitely been very patient with me with my disobedience um, because he definitely could have just left me in my sinfulness. He definitely could have just been like, forget it. I'm not even going to use her. But um, he still found me fit and worthy to be used and to be a minister in his kingdom. And I know being a minister is not where I'm going to stop at. I know what I'm supposed to be. I know who I am going to be. Um, and that scares me. But I rather move in obedience with a little bit of fear than be disobedient and um it's okay to have fear i don't like when people tell us not to be afraid because it's just impossible we're human we're going to be afraid but the uh, the difference is don't allow your fear to keep you from believing believe him even when you are afraid because then he's able to wipe that fear from you when you stop believing then you allow your fear to take control and that's basically what i used to do um, I let the fear take control. So, yeah. Um, I'm going to just put that he is patient. With the disobedient. Moving on. Oh, you guys can't see that. Then it says abundant and loving kindness. So he is basically a personal and consistent God. He demonstrates unconditional tenderness, love, and mercy. So abundant and loving kindness. And when I say that he's a personal God, um, I don't know if you guys pay attention to like other religions. But when I hear from people who are like... Um, a part of other religions i never really fully understand how they worship gods that don't um truly offer any type of peace to them and that they can't have a personal relationship with like i'm so happy that i can go to god and call him father <clears throat> i can call him friend i can call him com um, confident i can call him my comforter I can call him my lover. Like, I can call God so many different things. Even though he is God, he is the source of things. He is Alpha and Omega. Um, I can have a intimate, personal relationship with him. One minute he can be, I can pray Heavenly Father. The next minute I can just randomly be talking to him while I'm sitting on bed. And I could talk to him like a friend. There's no rituals that I have to follow. There's no routine that I have to follow. Like, he is very personal. So if I feel like crying out to him with snot running down my nose and tears running down my eyes, I can do that. If I want to laugh and joke with God, I can do that. Like, a lot of other religions can't do that. They're very much um, confined into, like, this kind of ritual and routine when they're going to their so-called god and i don't mean to say so-called gods that is so rude but um when they're going to their gods they can't be personal everyone is on the same level when they're going to their gods the way i go to my father is not going to be the same way you go to your father so even though we worship the same god we definitely have different personal relationships with him and i just i love that we have that privilege and ability to do that um so he's definitely a personal and consistent god
Then it says, one who relents from doing harm. So, um, God doesn't enjoy harming his children. He obviously does not seek to harm us. He, um, prefers good for us. He will always find a way to get our attention without harm unless extremely necessary. So, in this case with Jonah, um, he tried so many different things to get his attention without harming Jonah. Um, you know, he told Jonah simply what to do. Jonah decided to leave. He then decided to, um, you know, stir up a storm. The storm did nothing. So then the boat almost drowned. That did nothing. The ship was almost wrecked. That didn't like Jonah was down there sleeping at the bottom of the ship peacefully like he was not paying attention. So because you're not paying attention, OK, let's cast lots. The lot falls on you. So now God is putting it like putting it front and center. I'm trying to get your attention. I don't want to harm you. Pay attention. Do what I'm asking. You choose not to. So now they got to throw you overboard. So. You're now thrown overboard. You could have drowned. You could have uh, had hypothermia. Like, there's so many different possibilities. Being thrown in a sea. I don't, I don't even know. But, like, there's so many different possibilities. And yet again, he didn't want to harm you. So, he had a fish prepared to swallow you whole. Now, you could have died in this fish. You was in this fish for three days and three nights. But you didn't. So, it's like, God will try to get your attention. And though we feel like it's to harm us... Is never really to harm us if you really honestly sit and think and look at the things. I know for me, I've been put in situations before where I'm just like, really, God, you really want to allow this to happen? But majority of the times, the things that I was in was because of my own foolishness, because of my own dis um, disobedience, and because I chose not to pay attention to him. There was one instance where, um, I mentioned this in the, uh, what was it called? The, uh... What was it? The, the the I forgot one of my testimony videos. I forgot what I titled the uh, testimony video, but um, it was the one on being raped and molested. That one, um, where God was trying to get my attention for the longest, and I went to hang out with a guy, and I was basically almost gang raped because I wasn't paying attention to the signs and the things that were supposed to be, um, not supposed to be, but the things that God was trying to get me to see, and um, it took me a minute to honestly like fully pay attention because God was really giving me signs I was feeling like really strange and stuff like that and um it took me a minute but when I was able to pay attention I was able to escape the harm that was going to happen to me so um we definitely need to pay attention the tiniest things it, even if it's like a shift in the wind like things like that can really really be God trying to get your attention so that you're not put in harm's way. So um I highly suggest if you're if if God is, is trying to get your attention in the tiniest way, it could be a little puppy, I don't care what it is, an ant, pay attention. Because he will he will use the smallest things and then those small things will start to have a snowball effect. And if we don't pay attention, he'll get your attention in like the worst possible we think it's the worst possible way. But um, it's the only way that he can get us, get our attention. So I'm going to underline this one who relents from doing harm. And I'm going to say God does not enjoy harming. His children. Going on to verse 3, he then says, It is better for me to die than to live. So, the repentance and the salvation of the people of Nineveh is so painful to Jonah. Jonah, who is a prophet, who is one of God's chosen people to speak God's words, okay? Um, is so painful to him that he would rather die than think about it. He also states that this was his um, reason he fled the call. Not out of fear that he would be ineffective, but fear that he would be effective. And... Sadly, there are people out there who are afraid of being effective. Um, I don't think I've ever had that kind of fear. I've always feared being ineffective. Like, I always thought that when I would speak, things wouldn't be, um, you know, have an effect on people to help them. But there are people out there in the world who are afraid of being effective in the kingdom of God. And that's very, very sad. Like, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to say it like that. That sounds terrible. Oh, my God. But it's um <laughs> very much um, a real thing where there are people out there who don't want to do the work of God, the will of God, because they're afraid of being effective in the kingdom. 
I, I don't even know like that just it's, it's mind-blowing but um, instead of rejoicing in the saved lives and the lost souls being found Jonah got angry that a pagan nation was saved it made no sense to him so he felt like God was wrong um, and then also human logic questions fairness um, when evil is forgiven I'm sorry. Human logic questions fairness when evil is forgiven. However, in doing so, we fail to see that if we, I'm sorry, that if evil were not graciously forgiven, everyone would be destroyed. So we're all, we're, we're basically born in sin, period. We're born in sin. We all have an evil part of us. Um, I, I don't care what no one says. Everybody has the potential to be evil, period. Um, there are some people who will argue that they can't be. But I'm here to say that everyone has the potential to be evil, just like everyone has the potential to be good. Um, it's our choice, the path that we take, which which um, side we fall on. But uh, for us to question the fairness of God and him forgiving evil, and I don't want to say evil people, but people who do wicked things or sinful things, it's kind of like, if he doesn't do that, then we might as well all be destroyed, because Adam and Eve sinned, their sin then caused them to be wicked, they had a son, they had sons, Cain and Abel, um, Cain killed Abel, so if that was the case, I don't think we'd be on this earth, period, um, honestly, so for Jonah to say, it is better for me to, to die than to live, it's kind of like, are you serious? You're a prophet. You just was effective in uh, spreading the word of God. You allowed, not even allowed, you brought these pagan people, these Gentiles, into the light. So now their souls are no longer lost. They're found. And you're angry because God forgave them, because he saved them? That doesn't make sense to me. As a prophet, he should have been very joyous. He should have been happy. He should have been, you know, celebrating with them, fasting and praying with them, helping them to pray. But instead, you sitting out on the side, somewhere on the east side, chilling, waiting to see if God reprimands them. Like, that makes no sense. But um, unfortunately, there are people in ministry that are like that. They will judge you and they will feel that their judgment is correct and get upset if God's judgment is contrary to their judgment. And um, we can't expect God to give the judgment that we believe someone deserves. It just, it, it, it doesn't make sense. Like, never does, never will. Um, so moving on. Then it says, then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah in expressing his anger against God was being honest about his feelings, which is something good. It's okay to be honest about your feelings to God. It, God wants you to be honest and vulnerable. He already, he already knows how you feel. He already sees your heart. So it's okay to be honest, but we should um, not for a moment think that all of our feelings towards God is justified. So I can be angry personally with God. Um, because of all the losses that have hit my family back to back to back. Like, literally, there has been lost after lost after lost after lost. And it's hard. Like, it's ridiculous. Um, and especially the one recently with my cousin. That hit out of the blue. Like, that literally found out through Facebook, which unfortunately is sad. But um, we found out through Facebook, through her sister, that she died. And it's just like, what? I don't understand. You was just alive the other day and now you're dead? Like, why is God taking away my... Like, I literally... There has been a time where I'm like, God, why are you taking people from me? Like, honestly. You took my bishop. You took my uncle. I'm not uncle. Yeah, you took my uncles. You took my grandmother. You took um one of the men that I considered a spiritual... Father. Like, you're taking people back to back to back. And um, I feel like he's wrong. And it's okay for me to feel that way because it's just me being honest. But I'm not justified in my feelings toward him, if that makes sense. Like, I can be upset, I can be angry, but am I justified in being that way? Because, again, he controls everything. He has a purpose for everything. So, though I might be upset, it's okay. So, um, you know, God likes us to question him because our questions kind of reveal our hearts. It also puts us on a proper ground before him because he has every right to question us and we owe him answers so i can be upset with god and be like why did you do this but god can ask me a question and he don't he doesn't have to answer my question but i have to answer his question in order for him to not even for him for me to understand what my heart is um and then it says then i wrote that jonah was angry towards god um and it was all right for jonah to state his anger towards god but he also must repent of his anger towards god and again this has to do kind of comparison with job um, again, Job was angry. Job, you know, he stated his anger. If you read the book of Job, he stated that he was angry. 
Um, but even in his anger, he repented, you know, he kind of was like, you know, Lord, forgive me. I'm angry. Um, I feel justified in this, but forgive me. Um, whereas Jonah is just like, nope, I don't care. I'm angry with you. I have a right to be angry. I want you to kill me because you saved a bunch of lost souls. And because I prophesied and did the right thing and your word came true, I'm angry now. So I have the right to be angry. And instead of him, again, sitting back, being happy, being joyous, thanking God, praying to God, he's now angry, which can then put him in a sinful kind of um, position because anger can make us sinful. I know for me, I've been angry plenty of times with people and it has made me say, say things I didn't mean to say, do things I didn't mean to do. Like anger can really just like be a doorway to sin. So then in verse five, it says that, um, that he sat on the east side of the city. There he made, sh uh, made him shelter. Okay. Sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. So, um, sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. So, Jonah now seems to hope that the repentance of Nineveh was lacking, and then now he hopes that he will see the city destroyed after all. He goes out of the city for safety. So, let me just write this down. Jonah is hoping... For their failure. So he's hoping that you know their repentance was a little one and done type of thing. He doesn't want them to have a heart change. So instead of him, like I said before, going to actually fast and pray with them, he's now leaving them to their own devices instead of guiding them. You're leaving them, and now you're going to sit on a side praying and hoping that they fail so that they can be punished the way you think they deserve to be punished and as a prophet it makes no sense and i'm going to keep saying it makes no sense because he is a prophet of god and god gave you two chances and god forgave you and he had mercy on you but you're not extending that mercy to others it makes no sense like it, it just jonah pisses me off <laughs> honestly like it really irritates me um because like you had the audacity to leave the city, go somewhere else to find you some shelter so that you're good, but you're not concerned about the souls of these people. You're only concerned with the judgment that they should receive. That, that, it's terrible. It's terrible in every way. So, he's basically hoping for their failure. Instead of helping them grow. He's now going to make himself kind of like a stumbling block for these people. And the Bible tells us not to be a stumbling block. I forgot what verse that is, but it tells us not to be a stumbling block to anyone. So verse six, it says the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah. So, um, you know, God prepares a plant to shelter Jonah as he waited, hoping that the city would be destroyed. Yes, yeah, Stacey, he definitely was all about him. And as a prophet, I don't think that's correct. Because when you are a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a bishop, a minister, when you're any of those things, it's not about you. It's about other people and their souls. It's about bringing people to the kingdom of God. Um, you know, it's never about you. And he, I feel like he lost focus of that just because he was in his own feelings. And I know when you are in those type of positions, bishop, pastor, apostle, evangelist, deacon, whatever, um, you have to find a way to get out of your feelings and out of yourself um, and be about the people. And I know it's hard because I've, I've seen people in church and I know how annoying and crazy people can be and how you can easily get caught up in your own personal feelings. But as a prophet, he should have known... Um, that he had a specific duty he had a job he was to steward over these people and make sure that these people were going about things correctly um instead of going to the side to chill out under some shade and waiting for them to fail like makes no sense but um yeah so you know god prepared a plan to shelter him as he waited hoping that the city would be destroyed now th this for me i think is amazing because again this is another instance when god could have immediately just been like i'm done with jonah 
But instead of being done with him, he provided Jonah with some, like, literally provided him with some shade, some shelter, as Jonah sat and watched and waited for these people to be destroyed. And um, for me, I think that's an eye opener because there have been instances for me, I can say for me with my father, um, you know, my father and I, we, we had a good relationship, but now it's just like terrible. Um, and I'm not gonna lie, there has been moments where I would get pissed off about certain things with my father because it's just like I don't understand it I feel like he needs to be judged a certain way okay but I am not God so I cannot say that he deserves it but me being human I feel like he deserves a certain a certain judgment and when it doesn't happen I get upset and when I see that you know he's out here doing him having a good time it just pisses me off like it makes me angry like so bad um you know and while I'm sitting here in my anger you know, God will be like, all right, he'll come for me. He'll rub my back. And it's just like, really, God? You're going to be okay with me being angry? You're going to be okay with me thinking sinful things about my dad? You're going to be okay with that um, instead of reprimanding me like you should? And that's just the type of God that he is. He's not going to always give you the judgment or the punishment you think you deserve, um, especially since his son came to earth and took the punishment for us. But what he will do is continue to um, have an outpour of love towards you, an outpour of compassion and mercy towards you. And what happens is when he continues to love on you and have compassion and comfort you and lo um, show mercy to you, eventually what's going to happen is your emotions and your feelings are going to start. You might get irritated at one point, but what's going to happen is you're going to start to have this kind of feeling of conviction because he's continuously loving on you. And um, you're going to start to feel like, okay, maybe I shouldn't be feeling, you know, thinking this way about such and such, or I shouldn't be doing this about such and such. Um, you know, so instead of God being like, nope, Jonah, I'm done with you. I'm going to just let you, you know, leave you to your own devices. God was like, you know what? No, I'm going to provide you with a plant to shade you. I'm going to allow you to sit here and pray on the downfall of these people. That That's basically what it was. Like, he let it happen. Um, and then... It says that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So despite Jonah's ways, God still managed to provide for him and protect him. Despite how angry you are, despite how rude you are to someone, despite how twisted you can be. I don't want to say evil. So yeah, despite how twisted you can be, God still will protect you and provide for you. Because you are his child. Um, and as a parent, he's not going to just neglect you. Um... Yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> so as a parent, he's not just going to neglect you. So I'm going to verse 7. It says that God prepared a worm and it so damaged the plant that it withered. So here's another miracle that proves um, that God is sovereign. Okay. Um, you know, that he's sovereign and he's almighty. He commands the air. He commands the earth. He commands the animals and man. Everything above in the heavens and under it is his to control. So this is just another show of God's power, um, of, his, of him being sovereign over man, over beasts, over plants, over everything. I mean, he commanded the sea. He commanded the wind when Jonah was on the boat. Then he commanded the fish to swallow him up. And then he commanded the fish to spit him out. Then he commanded the plant to grow. And then he commanded a worm to wither the plant. So like he's commanding all of these things. I mean, he's powerful. That's it. He's almighty. He's alpha and omega. He that it is what it is. So um, going to verse eight. Where is it? OK, it says when the sun rose, that God prepared a vehement east wind. So this was basically not a cooling wind. This was a harsh, hot wind that gave no help or relief. So it's kind of like that, that kind of hot air that blows when it's 104 degrees outside. That kind of air is just, it, it's, it is so irritating. I personally don't like summer because, you know, in summer you don't really get no air. And the air that blows is really, really dry. It's really, really, like, irritating. It, it, it's kind of like when you're scratching on a chalkboard to me. That's what I feel like the summer air is like. Because there's no, like, cool air. It's all hot. So, um, not only did he provide you with shelter and shade but then he then allowed a worm to take it away and then on top of him taking that shade away he was like you know what now i'm gonna take this air and i'm not even gonna make it cool air i'm gonna make it hot harsh wind 
to make you more irritated. And I don't want to say that God likes to irritate us because that's not the case. <laughs> but God, okay, so in my own little mind, I call it God being petty. And I know that's like the worst thing to say. But I know some of you feel that way, that God has moments of being petty, okay? I'm just going to say it. Some some of you might disagree with me. Someone might be saying, oh my God, pray for her. But it's true. I feel like sometimes God can be like the pettiest person on earth. I, I honestly feel that way. Because this for me is kind of like one of those petty moments. And I know it sounds weird, me, me calling God petty. But that is the only term that I can think of right now to say what I'm about to say. So it's kind of like you gave him shelter. First of all, you allowed him to be angry. Um, you know, you allowed him to be angry. You, you, you just let him be angry. That's one. Then you gave him shelter when he walked away from everyone being angry. Then he told you he had the audacity, Jonah had the audacity to tell God, it's better for me to die than to live. So now you're telling God Almighty to kill you, kill you. The God that created you, the God that made you who you are, you're telling him to take you off of the earth, okay? So then he gives you shelter. Then he takes that shelter. Okay? So you gave him something. You took it back. That's what we call, you know, Indian giving, right? <laughs> and then on top of taking it away, because back in that time, you know, we all know it was hot as ever back in that time. In Bible era time. Then you don't, you, 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 you send <laughs> hot air. Hot air after you took the shelter. And I'm sure Jonah was sweating sweating a hot mess he ain't had no water he ain't have a rag to wipe his face <laughs> like he probably had sweat going down his eyes and everything like you had the audacity god to send hot air on top of him and then to follow that up it says the sun beat on jonah's head so that he grew faint so now you allow me to become overheated to faint I feel like God is petty at times. And it's not a bad petty like how we are petty. Yes, yeah, Stacey, um, God made a definite point for you. Yeah, um, God definitely does things not out of spite, but to, again, get your attention. And yes, he does it by any means necessary. I call it being petty, but, you know, for God, it's not being petty. It's him trying to get your attention the best way he knows how to get your attention, the best way that you're going to pay attention to him. Um, and unfortunately, some people don't pay attention to the little small things, you know, again, it snowballs into a large effect until you see something that um, really gets your attention. So, like I said, it then says that uh, the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. So just as he was angry, God allowed him to feel the heat of his anger. So it might seem petty, but this was now God allowing jonah to physically feel the anger that was boiling inside of him and i felt like that was just such such a um a profound thing so i'm actually gonna underline this one and write this one out the sun beat on jonah's head so that he grew faint god allowed jonah to feel the heat of his anger. Okay. Yes, yes, true, Tanya, true. We definitely, um, I feel like a lot of us need to be very mindful of the things we say. Because I know I say a lot of things, God, when I'm, like, in a heat of anger. <laughs> I say a lot of things. And I thank God he doesn't um, give me what I ask for a majority of the times. Um, because it's just like, are you really that, like, are you really that sane with what you're saying that you rather die than live? Like, do you understand what you're saying? Do you truly get the concept of what you're saying? So, yeah, I definitely agree. That's definitely a good way of putting it. Yeah. Um, then this is still verse 8, right? Yeah. Again, back to verse 8. He still continues. Um, then he says, he wished death for himself and said it. It is better for me to die than to live. So, again, you know, 
he is again missing the whole point of um everything they got he's missing the whole thing of god trying to get his attention and now for the second time he's saying it's better for me to die than to live and it's just like are you serious you're allowing a silly thing like a plant to become your idol you're allowing a, a silly thing to um almost kind of remove yourself from god's love like it, it it just makes no sense that you would prefer death over the lives of several people that were saved and these are probably people he don't even have a personal connection with he probably just don't like them because of the history you know because i feel like it's one of those things like you grow up not liking someone because your relatives didn't like this person and you don't even know the reason why they don't like the person you just know that they don't like the person and it's just like really why so yeah um so verse nine so again god is asking him is it right for you to be angry about the plant so the plant was just a plant and jonah had no personal interest or investment in the plant except that it provided for him at that moment and what it provided was shelter so then jonah goes and says um it is right for me to be angry even to death so jonah again shows his irrational thoughts his hatred for the ninevites ran deep he was not willing to invest himself in god's forgiveness of them so the question i have is would you be willing to invest yourself in god's forgiveness for um anyone who hurt or harmed you and i feel like that's a good question to ask because i know for me use i'm gonna use my father as an example i was not willing to invest in god's forgiveness for him like at all like I, it was bad you guys i would curse my father out i would send him crazy text messages i would disrespect my father on a whole day like I didn't care because what my dad did at that point in time broke me. It upset me. It's like, you have four kids. You hurt my mother. Like, it pissed me off to the point where I could not see forgiveness. I kind of saw red. I blinked out. Like, I scared my dad one time. He had to run out the house and call my mother and call me crazy because I blacked on him. And it wasn't a good thing. Like, it wasn't good at all. But it took me years, like, years for me to even <laughs> accept to forgive him because it hurt and and even to this day it's just like really do i have to answer the phone when he calls do i have to respond like when he texts me i don't respond to his texts because i just i don't feel like being bothered but when he calls my phone it's just like okay do i answer this phone and do i answer with kindness or do i ignore him or do i answer the phone and be rude and i'm being honest right now like i'm being completely transparent when it comes to this so asking that question of would you be willing to invest yourself in god's forgiveness of whoever hurt you or harmed you is a good question i know for me with my brother it took me a while to forgive him um because i was put in some situations because of him um and i talked about this in my testimony video if you guys saw it but I mean, it took me a while and there are some times where i still get pissed off about it but um i forgive him it took me some time though to really invest in god's forgiveness um for him and for my dad um, you know, I'm still, I, there are some things right now, like with my aunt, I had a, a falling out with my aunt. Like she publicly went on my Facebook page and just went off. Like my aunt went off on me you guys on Facebook, on Facebook. And I'm not sure if any of you guys saw, but I know one of the ladies, one of the evangelists at my church saw it. And I had to take it down because my aunt was coming at me as if I was a stranger, like literally posting her number, coming at me, talking about she waiting on me. Did, like she went off and it's gonna take me some time to forgive her right now i can't even be in her vicinity because it pisses me off that you you just you treated your niece that way um i have another aunt that i don't even really communicate with her because she hurt me when i was pregnant like she emotionally hurt me so i'm still hurt dealing with that so you know there i'm learning a lot especially with me now <laughs> about to be elevated there's a lot of things that i need to work on with the next five months and that is and for me i know it's going to be heavy on forgiveness because i need to forgive a lot of people for the hurt and it's not even about like physical hurt it's more of an emotional hurt or a mental hurt because they've hurt me and to this day i don't even talk to my aunt like i can see my aunt i won't even say nothing to her and this is my father's sister. And then my other aunt, which is my mother's sister, that came at me on Facebook. I don't even want to be around her presence. Like, I don't. And it's bad that I feel that way. And I'm I'm only human. So, you know, there's so much that I can do. But I know that I need to invest in God's forgiveness of them. 
because he has forgiven me for so many things. I have hurt people and he has forgiven me. I have said things to people and he has forgiven me. But unfortunately, when it comes to the hurt being aimed at us, we find it hard to forgive other people. But we always expect God to forgive us when we're doing something. So for me, I know I really have to invest in forgiveness <laughs> a lot. Yeah, I know with my mom's sister, the one that was on Facebook coming at me with her, I know it 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 wasn't naturally her. I know it's a lot of hurt with my grandmother um being, you know, being gone and stuff like that. I understand that. But at the same time, it's just like you gonna come at your niece like that? Like me? Little old me? Like what did I do? And and the thing is she I guess she felt convicted about a status that I wrote. Um, because I, I literally, now when I write statuses and, you know, things on Facebook, I don't do them subliminally. They're not about people and gen they're just general statements. But I guess because of the situation that was happening at that time, she took it personal and, um, she wrote on my Facebook and took it personal. And I explained to her that it was not even about her. It was just a general statement because, um, you know, I was getting fed up with people treating my mother a certain way. And it had nothing to do with my aunt. It had nothing to do with, like, it was just a general thing. I'm sick of people treating my mother a certain way and expecting her kids, her oldest kids. I'm about to be 28. My brother's about to be 25. People expect me and him not to say anything. And we've been quiet for so many years, just allowing people to say what they want to say. But then we have to see my mother cry. We have to, um, you know, talk to her and make sure she's good. And I got to a point where I was just irritated. So I put up a, just a general status that I wasn't going to take it anymore. People being rude. She took it the wrong way. She took it personal. And she went on Facebook, like on Facebook publicly. Not even like she like sent me a personal message, text my phone or anything. Like she put it on Facebook, guys. And the things she was saying about my mother and the things she was saying about me, it really hurt me because it's just like, you're really going to say those things? Like, that's your sister, number one. I'm your niece. I'm your first niece on top of that. Like, you really saying that stuff to me? And, like, you had the audacity to come at me like I was somebody on the street and then you put your number out there multiple times. And then when I didn't respond, you just kept going and going. Like, that hurt. So I'm really at a point, and I would literally just talk to my mother about this because my grandfather's birthday was yesterday. And um, with my grandmother, I think it's been a month now, um, yeah, a month since she's been gone, um, you know, they all went to his house for dinner. And I, I told my mother I wasn't going. I, I didn't want to be around my, my, my grandma, my aunt. I mean, I didn't want to be around my aunt. I didn't want to be around my uncle because my uncle said some things as well. So it was just like, I didn't want to be around none of them. And I know my mom, she, she literally just told me that I'm going to have to work on that now that I'm about to be elevated. And I know I do because I can't have things hindering me. But um, the fleshly part of me is just like not right now. So that's definitely something I need to um, that I'm praying on and asking God to help me with because it's hard. I told you guys, one of my, my father's sister, I haven't spoken to her in a while. And it's bad. Um, so, you know, I just I don't know. I thought that was really interesting. This whole um, interaction with God asking him, is, is it all right for him to be angry and him saying it's OK even to death? Um, it's just like. Do you really want to die or do you just want to forgive because God forgave? So, yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree, Stacey. We, people definitely need to be um, careful with their words. And, you know, we never really pay attention to the words that we say. We never really do. Um, we allow words. I mean, the Bible tells you that, you know, the words can cut. They can heal. They can comfort. They can kill. The words can do a lot. Um, you know, words really do damage people. And unfortunately, we don't think about that. We are in the heat of the moment and people say things and it's just like, really? Did you just say that? And I'm not going to say I haven't said things. I've said things to people before in the heat of the moment. But um, thank God I've been, you know, I've been good <laughs> on that, you know, reacting with my, my words so quickly. Um, but when things are said to me or about my mother or about my siblings or anybody that I love, and it's coming from someone that I love. It's just like, mm, okay, God help me um, to forgive because it's going to take me a minute. And um, yeah, Tanya, I definitely agree. It's giving the devil power. Yes, I, I agree because um, when you don't forgive, um, it allows him to have a foothold. Or it, it, when you don't forgive someone and you allow that anger and that bitterness to um, kind of grow, it gives the enemy a foot a foothold, I guess, if you will to now come and run rampant in your relationship with people. 
And I know for me, it's done that in my personal relationship with my son's father. I've been angry before with my um, son's father. I've been, um, you know, I've, I've just had so many emotions <laughs> with everything that we had gone through over the past six years. And um, I definitely gave the enemy a foothold in my relationship to the point where it kind of shut me down, made me be quiet. So um, I definitely do. Yeah, it is giving him power and I'm I'm learning, you know, um, it has taken me some time to get to the point that I'm at now, <laughs> but I'm definitely learning. And I know these next five months are going to be insane. It's going to be insane because of that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep saying because of the elevation, because anytime you're getting elevated in the kingdom of God, um, the enemy is going to try to derail you. He is going to try to do something to um, not make you go through with it. But um, yeah, it's <sighs> yeah. <laughs> It's been an interesting, um, it's only what, been three months now in, in 2019 and, and a lot has transpired in 2019 already. It's just like, if the first three months have been this crazy, what should I expect for the rest of the year? But you know, it is what it is. Yeah, definitely, Tanya. I'm definitely, um, I've definitely gotten to a point where I don't allow situations and people to dictate my mood. Now, I'm not going to lie and say that that's 100% true because there, there are some times where I'm just like, I shut down and I get angry over things. But I've definitely gotten better with that. And I know my, my bishop actually just spoke to me about that. Um, he said he sees the, you know, the major growth and changes um, because, I, like I said, I, I mentioned this before. I was, I'm, I'm on, you know, I'm one of the two. I'm either going to lash out and black out and you ain't going to know who I am. Like, you're going to look at me like a crazy, kind of like I did to my father. Or I'm going to remain quiet. And it's kind of like how I do with my relationship with my son's father. Um, when he makes me upset or does something, I don't lash out at him. I just, I, I shut down. And when it comes, like, to the relationship with my dad, when he says something to me, I'm not quiet. I lash out. So, for some odd reason, when it comes to my dad and my son's father, um... I'm on the opposite side of the spectrum with both of them. But nowadays, I'm definitely like, um, you know, I take a minute to really just see things with a different perspective and not just through my eyes um, so that I don't lash out or remain too quiet. So I'm definitely getting better at that for sure. Yes, yes, Missy. Um, yeah, studying Jonah. I I don't even know why. I don't even know why I wanted to study Jonah. I think it was just because it was a small book, and I was like, yeah, um, you know, it's four chapters. We can study it. And then when I actually studied it, I was just like mind blown with the things because Jonah, though he we we you know he's very stupid. Period. Like Jonah's stupid. I don't care. But um, though he's stupid, there's so much that you can learn about um not taking control forgiving people and letting God just be God um because that's something Jonah just doesn't do he tries to take everything into his own hands he tries to become his own God which sucks yeah Tanya um I'm definitely expecting it and I know that when certain things come I know what it is it's kind of like I can see the punch coming before it's coming I don't want to be the type of person where I ignore what's going on and then I just get punched out of the blue like I'm aware of the punches so at least when they come I can be a little bit more guarded I'll know how to react I'll know um you know it's not per se this person just saying something out of their mouths but it's the enemy using that person's mouthpiece to get to me so I'm definitely um aware of it I don't want to expect it <laughs> but I know that these next five months are going to be crazy and then even after the five months are over and I'm elevated. I know it's going to get even more crazy. So I'm definitely seeing and keeping my, my vision clear. It's just a matter of when it happens. You know, can I really do things accordingly and properly? Yeah, Kimberly, that's definitely me. Um, I, I'm the same way. I shut down in a minute. And it's so bad because when I shut down, it kind of interrupts my appetite to the point where I don't want to eat food. I can eat a bunch of snacks. Like snacks is my thing. I'm I'm the queen of snacks. But when it comes to me shutting down, I don't I don't have an appetite to eat food. Um, and it's bad. So I'm definitely learning to um, not keep my mouth.
quiet as much. Like, I'm learning when to speak and when not to speak. Because there are some sometimes where I'll, I'll keep off at the mouth just because. Um, and then there are other times when I should be speaking, but I choose not to speak. So, but yeah. Okay, all right, let's finish these last two <laughs> verses. We done went off on a tangent. But, um, okay, so verse 10. It says, you had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow so basically jonah cared more for an insignificant portion of god's creation that he did nothing for over the portion that god loved most and that he helped bring to him so in this instance jonah's pissed off about a plant like you're pissed off about a plant okay because the plant withered away and couldn't provide you with shelter you didn't help that plant grow you didn't water that plant you did nothing to get that plant to come up that was all god right but then you should be happy about bringing the people or the ninevites to god watering them basically is you watered these people in europe and you're angry because they're saved it it makes no sense it's just like we need to be mindful of the things that we're really um caring about and the things that we're really focusing and investing our time in because some of the things we really invest our time in has nothing to do with God. Um, I, I don't want to say it has nothing to do with God, but it has nothing to do with his kingdom. Um, and because it has nothing to do with his kingdom, a lot of the times we're like, yes, I'm focusing on this. Versus the things that are of his kingdom that we should be focusing on, we care nothing about. Um, so, yeah. I'm sorry, guys. I'm just reading the comments. <laughs> Hold on. Um. <laughs> Stacy. Yeah, I think that's just something like people, you know, we, 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 we try to make sure we get our point across. And because we allow our flesh to react, um, we get so caught up and the tension and things like that and again there's nothing wrong with arguing i don't think there's anything wrong with arguing with someone but i think the problem comes when we allow our flesh to then take control and then our mouths to take control instead of really taking the time to think things through <laughs> tanya <laughs> you're learning to shut down that's funny <laughs> i'm like for me yeah like for me i was always the type to shut down um, but it got worse over the years, like really bad over the years. So now I'm learning to speak more, um, because I don't like, I'm the type of person that I could speak part. Like when I'm by myself in a room, I can speak what I need to say. I can get my point across, but when I'm around people, I shut down and I don't, I don't even know why. Like I know it's something, but I don't know what it is that makes me shut down. Um, but yeah. All right, so verse 11, yeah. So it says, should I not pity, wait, what, huh? Oh, <laughs> verse 11, so should I not pity Nineveh? So God is always concerned about the people, um, be it his chosen or not. We are all his workmanship, so he will always be concerned about the destruction of people. He is the God of all people. Um, and I say that because even though we understand God um, has his chosen, which are the Hebrews and Israelites, um, he cared about everyone. You know, God created the earth. He created all humans. You know, he created everyone in the image of himself. So though there are those who are wicked and choose, the, you know, choose not to obey him and those he left to the wayside, um, he definitely cares for everyone. Like, he loves all of us. But unfortunately, some of his chosen, you know, some of his chosen, some of his children, some of us in the world just don't care. Um, you know, and this is a perfect example of... Um, the the gentiles you know and this is even before christ came so this is a perfect example of him in a way trying to save everyone before jesus came and gave everyone a way to god um he he was trying to use jonah to do that to get to his people to save his people he was concerned about the people of ninevite um ninevite <laughs> he was concerned about the people of nineveh um you know he knew that they didn't really know what was right what was wrong and he didn't want to just leave them to their own devices he wanted to help them and i think more so it's because he kind of saw that their heart but he really couldn't do anything about it until they repented so he sent his prophet to kind of get them to that kind of um walkway in a sense so then it says who cannot wait where is it 
Oh, so here at the bottom it says, who cannot discern between their right hand and their left? Okay, so basically Nineveh had no moral judgment because they did not know God. They were by no, I mean, they were no, by no means innocent, but they also did not know how to escape their plight. So without knowledge, they would remain trapped in their wickedness. So obviously everyone knew who God was back in this time. You know, they knew who God was. They knew that was the God of the Hebrews, the God of the Israelites, but they didn't personally know him. And there's a difference between knowing of God and truly intimately knowing him. Because I can know someone, like I can know your best friend. I know your best friend. Your, your best friend's name is Sally. That's cool. But I don't personally know her in a sense that, you know, she's 18 years old. She got two kids. Um, she working, you know, nine to five, like she works jobs and things like that. I don't personally know her intimately to judge her, but I know of her because I know that's your best friend. That's it. So um, I feel like the, the, the Ninevites, they knew of God, but they didn't know him. And God could see that their hearts wanted to change, but they had no way of changing. So he thought, why not send my prophet? He sent probably the word. I'm going to call Jonah the worst prophet. I don't know if he was the worst prophet, but I'm going to call it the worst. Um, so he sent the worst prophet, okay, to help a sinful, na um, a sinful nation or a pagan nation come to God. And this is also another example of God using um, the least to the least. God using, I guess, um, I can't even think of what the scripture is called. Oh, God. I'm just going to say using the least to confound the what I, I can't remember the scripture. If someone remembers the scripture, please write it. But it's a scripture about how God uses something to confound the wise or the, the foolish. That's what it is. The foolish to confound the wise. So this is an example. He's taking a foolish prophet, his prophet Jonah, to change the hearts of a pagan nation, which I think is by far the craziest thing ever that you're using a foolish prophet. Like foolish prophet just doesn't sound right to me. But yeah. Um, so yeah, so again, we are born in sin and without a way of knowing our wrongs, how could we fix it and be right? There's really no way to fix your wrongs and your sins if you don't know that you're wrong and sinful. So he had to send someone to be that light. And this is kind of what Jonah was doing prior to Jesus came because we know that Jesus came to make it known that people were being sinful and doing wrong, but they didn't know they were doing wrong until jesus came same thing with the ninevites they kind of knew like you know you you can know something is wrong but do you really know that it's wrong until someone points it out and says that you're wrong kind of thing but yeah i didn't write all that down because i have my personal notes here <laughs> obviously but yeah that is it you guys um let me look i think there was something else that i wanted to share I'm not going to read this, but yeah, there's a long list of things. But um, final thoughts is basically that when your heart grows weak at the Lord's command um, and disobedience seems more appealing, hitting your knees rather than your feet will save you from the belly of the great fish. Jonah reminds you and me of our own weaknesses and failings, even as followers of Christ. Instead of seeing with our eyes and feeling with our hearts, we must see with God's eyes and love with his heart. The message of salvation is for all, whether God... I'm sorry, whether the Lord sends you to those in your own home, down the block, or halfway across the world, your response should be to get up and go as he commands. So, um, let me just fix this. All these errors. <laughs> let me close this pen. But yeah, um, you know, Jonah really reminds me that we're, that we're all human. No matter what you are in the kingdom of God, um, you definitely can fall short. Everyone falls short. It is what it is. Um, but we need to make sure we're looking at people in situations with guys, with God's eyes and not our own, because our eyes will definitely, um, hinder us and make us see things from a different perspective than God's. God is higher than us, so he can see things, um, with more of a wider view, a, a wider range, um, from beginning to end. We only see things from the the kind of uh, point that we're in so like if you're in the middle of things it looks crazy if you're in the beginning of things it looks crazy if you're in the end you're like okay cool but when you're in the end you can't see far enough to see the next thing god is higher enough higher enough higher god is high enough so um he definitely can see things from a wider vantage point if that makes sense um what else what else what else uh, there we go. So, um, 
there are six significant subjects about the book of Jonah that I got from Dr. J. Vernon McGee, and I actually put it in the um, printable, but I'm only going to read a few of those. So, um, the first one of the, one of the ones that I wrote is that the purpose of the book of Jonah is to show that God's purpose of grace cannot be frustrated. Jonah refused to go to Nineveh, but God was still going to get the message to Nineveh. The interesting thing in this particular case is that Jonah was going to be the witness for God in Nineveh. He didn't know he was going there, but he did go. Um, there's a truth that uh, God is good and gracious. So in Jonah 4, 2, which we already read, um, for the most part, uh, the most penetrating picture of God in the entire Bible um, is basically wrong to say that the Old Testament God reveals um, a God of wrath and that the New Testament God reveals a God of love um, because God is not a vengeful deity. He he is God. So um, he's almighty. He's all powerful. And I, I know a lot when I grew up, a lot of people would always tell me, you know, God is always evil and mean in the Old Testament. And, um, you know, he's a good God in the New Testament. But it's not that he's an evil God. He's just, you know doing what he is supposed to do he's reprimanding people and unfortunately they didn't have um an easy way of living back then because i know for the priests if you did something sinful and you went into the temple you dropped dead period nowadays if you do something evil and you go to the temple you're not going to drop dead you have an opportunity to repent you have an opportunity to go to god um and cry out to him you didn't really have that kind of opportunity back then there were so many things and rituals and things that had to be done because that was how it was until we came you know until jesus came to earth uh i'm trying to zoom out can i zoom out yeah but um yeah we're done with jonah i'm excited that we're done the next bible study will be james i'm aiming for may i'm, I'm really aiming for may but um most likely that will be done in uh june probably we'll see um, I do want to show you guys something now real quick. Let me grab it. Let me grab it. Okay. So you're welcome, Stacy. So, let me close up this Bible real quick and get this out the way so I can show you guys. Because I've been talking about this for like the longest since last year. They finally came. So, you guys know, um, I don't know if you guys know. I made this shirt at my fiance's. Oh, I'm saying my fiance. But I made this shirt at my son's father's house um, last year. Um, and it was it's, it's a hot, like, vibrant pink. It's coming up really, really, like, off color right now. But it's like a vibrant neon pink okay so it was thought of increase and it just had the scripture john 3 30 and i've been mentioning for the longest how i'm making shirts and stuff like that i'm definitely gonna i definitely will be making them i actually finally received them um so they're supposed to be four colors or five colors but um there's only two colors right now so i just want to show you guys the colors real quick it's going to be two different shirts so um I don't know what this is so i'm gonna take this out for the time being um it's it's written backwards so pay it no mind but this is kind of like a bubblegum pink color and i'm gonna put this one on a black t-shirt so it's gonna say daughter of increase on the front and then in the back it's going to have john 330 completely written out so we have this kind of like bubblegum pink color and i'm so excited you guys so excited and then the other color i have I don't want to show you guys this because it has his address. So hold on. Okay. <laughs> and then we have this nice kind of like purple color. Um, same thing, daughter of increase, the scripture, and then John 330. So I have these two colors right now. I cannot wait. So the pink is going to be on a black shirt and then the purple is going to be on like a heather gray color shirt. Um, I also will have a neon like hot pink coming as well as a beautiful blue color coming as well. Um, so it's going to be four colors. Right now we have these two to start with. I am going to order the hot pink and the blue color soon. Um, but I'm so, so excited for these. Like I can't wait. I'm actually going to order... Um, me some shirts so that I can actually have them done on the shirt so you guys can see what they look like 
on an actual shirt but they're here i'm so excited i'm gonna be doing wristbands um i definitely will be doing the coffee mugs soon i mentioned that before and a lot of you guys said do it so um coffee mugs are coming they're gonna be cute clear coffee mugs um so i can't wait um long sleeve yeah if you want a long sleeve you can um how i'm gonna do it is um you tell me the color of the shirt you tell me if you want a black and pink one or a gray and purple and then you tell me if you want it in short sleeve or long sleeve and i'll just order the shirts because i'm actually going to be doing um a bulk order of shirts from a company that my son's father uses because he does like t-shirt design so i definitely can do it Yes, Kimberly. I actually thought about doing a journal and a prayer journal kind of thing. Um, but I don't want to, like, I have so many ideas. <laughs> so many ideas. I want to make a devotional. I want to do a kind of prayer journal. Um, I want to actually write a book. And the Lord gave me this idea, like, years ago to write the book. And I have been sitting on it. But, yeah, I'm working on doing all of that. Um, I just want to take my time doing it. But, yeah, the journal, definitely for sure definitely for sure um but yeah right now i'm gonna start off with the t-shirts and the coffee mugs i'm not sure when the coffee mugs are gonna be like ready to go up for like purchase or anything like that just because i did order them um and i need to try to figure out how i want to do the designs but i'm super super excited super super excited for that <laughs> Tanya <laughs> pink and purple yeah I, I like them both it would be hard for me to I think I would always go with black though just because you know black slims everything out but I think the gray would be nice that's why I want to um get them done like get two test shirts done so that you guys can actually see how they look in person because right now on the paper for the labels they look really nice but um yeah I definitely want to see what they look like on the shirt so I actually probably should be ordering those shirts this week so that I can show you guys next week so yeah <laughs> what time is it okay making sure i'm good on time but yeah but okay I, this this thing is getting getting my nerve i don't like that little glare so i'm just gonna stick the bible there but yeah um so i'm gonna end the video here and then i'm going to quickly just make the update video so i can up, upload that for you guys because i did it yesterday but it just wasn't uploading but it was fine because i looked a hot mess anyway yesterday <laughs> so i'm going to go make that update video for you guys um and i think this weekend i'm gonna spend time i know this is like so random sorry youtube if you're watching this on youtube but i think this week i'm gonna organize my bookshelf both my book like all three of my bookshelves i need to organize them but i don't know how it's kind of hard to figure out how i want to do it because i have so many books thank you tanya <laughs> yes i'm like super super excited and nervous even though it's like five months away, I know these five months are going to fly. But even with that, it's like a lot of stuff that I have to do within those five months. So that's what I'm going to do the update video. But yeah, I'm going to stop rambling and I'm going to end this video <laughs> so that I can go record the update for you guys. And um, yeah, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, any ideas or anything, just let me know. I always say that I'm going to rewatch these live videos, but I never rewatch them. And I know a lot of you guys write comments when you like watch the replays. I'm terrible at that. So if you do have anything that you want me to answer, like that's pressing, just comment in the group. You can um, Facebook message me, Instagram message me, email me, whatever the case, um, because I'm terrible at watching the lives. And I probably should rewatch all of my live videos, like just pick a week and just rewatch them all so I can answer all the questions that have been asked because I'm slacking on that. But yeah, you're welcome, Tanya. <laughs> Yeah, so the next lesson, um, Bible study will be definitely on James. I just, I don't know if it's going to be in May or June. I'm striving for May if I can get everything done by then, but if not, definitely June. So the next one definitely will be in, um, will be James. I think the only Bible study we probably won't tackle will be Hosea, only because Hosea is like 14 chapters. That's like 14 weeks. I don't, I don't want to spend 14 weeks <laughs> studying, so probably the only thing we won't study this year will be Hosea but if not then Hosea definitely will be done the beginning of 2020 but that's it for now I'll see you guys later on and yeah have a great rest of the day bye mm -hmm.